are doomed, Doctor. Doomed! You are piloting your TARDIS into a deadly trap, and even you will not suspect until it's far too late. <laughs> you know, if you're going to spy on me, you really should turn the speaker off. <laughs> My dear Doctor, after our many centuries of conflict, naturally I wished you to know that your certain death is now certain! But even you will never suspect that your destruction awaits you on planet Zaston 4. You only turned the picture off, I'm afraid. I can still hear you. I know that. Of course I know that. Curse you! Now, I wanted to talk to you anyway. I have some news that even my arch enemy needs to hear. Uh, meet me on the planet Tercerus in two hours relative time. And do try not to be late. Walk me while you may, Doctor. My revenge will be all the sweeter. And it will be a deadly vengeance. It will be the deadly vengeance of deadly revenge! <laughs> Planet Tercerus, once home to the Tercerons, the most kindly and peace-loving race I've ever encountered, and yet the most shunned and abhorred species in all history. Why? They could communicate only by precisely modulated gastric emission. Oh, no. Planet of the Bottomberg. So what happened to them? They discovered fire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, because no one has set foot on this planet for a hundred years, you thought you had escaped my traps of death. But you forget, Doctor, I too have a TARDIS. When you told me to meet you at Castle Tercerus, I simply travelled back in time a hundred years. And I bribed the architect. Say hello to the Spikes of Doom. <laughs> Say hello to the sofa of reasonable comfort. Naturally, I anticipated your journey back in time, and so I travelled slightly further back and bribed the architect first. Or so you think. Naturally, I anticipated your travelling back in time, so I travelled back in time to an even further point. And I bribed the architect first. <laughs> Well, naturally, I anticipated your journey back to an even earlier point. Doctor, will you stop showing off? You've got something to tell the Master. Just tell him. Very well. I recently calculated that I have saved every planet in the known universe a minimum of 27 times. But, you know, I have grown weary of all the evil in the cosmos, all the cruelty, all the suffering, all those endless gravel quarries. And so I have decided to retire, settle down, and get married. What? Yes. Without even knowing I was looking, I have found a woman to love. A woman more fascinating than all my travels through time and space. A girl more exciting than an escape up a ventilation shaft. A lover more thrilling than an army of cybernetic slugs. Sadly, Doctor, I cannot wish you a long and happy marriage. Because the moment I'm done with this nauseating conversation, I shall travel back in time once more and buy the architect an expensive dinner and suggest he fits a lever just here and a trapdoor leading to the vast and disgusting sewers of Tercerus. Exactly there! Prepare for 500 miles of fear and feces. Goodbye forever, 
Mr. and Mrs. Doctor. <laughs> Since you appear to have fallen down a sewer, you won't be able to have dinner with the architect. Although, in fact, he's already eaten. Because I had dinner with him and suggested he place the trapdoor right here. Oh. Keep along, my dear. Not so fast. How can he be here? He just fell in the sewers. And why is he so much older? Because it's taken me 312 years to climb out of those sewers. And then naturally you found your TARDIS and traveled back in time to the present day. No doubt to wreak one of your terrible revenge things. <laughs> yes. But this time, I did not come alone. <laughs> Three centuries of climbing through those sewers. Only the Daleks would accompany me. Because only the Daleks don't have noses. So, Doctor, we meet again? Yes. How are things? Observe, Doctor. I am no longer merely a Time Lord. My body has been augmented by superior Dalek technology. So what can you do with that, then? You don't know, do you? Exterminate! 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 Stop! No! After 312 years of climbing through the biggest and most disgusting sewers in the cosmos, after three centuries of wading through those vast, steamy lakes, climbing those huge, squelchy mountains, after a lifetime of only dung slugs for food and the occasional company on the Long, lonely nights. After all that, I'm going to kill the doctor myself with my own bare hands. Die, doctor! Die! Don't worry. I believe he knows the way out. Six years in a sewer. <sighs> Wait for me. Wait for me. Well, these corridors all look the same. We should be safe in here. Exterminating you would be the most sensible thing to do. Why do they always change their minds at the last moment? I'll explain later. Behold! Once again, I have been augmented by superior Dalek technology, rejuvenating my physical form and granting me even more power over the cosmos. And I notice breasts. They're not breasts, okay? They're Dalek bumps. They can detect ion-charged emissions and operate as etheric beam locators at a distance of up to 20,000 light years. They are also extremely firm. What are you trying to say? Oh, nothing. Why are the Daleks helping you? What are you giving them in return? I have granted them secrets of the Zectronic energy beam. Oh. Full with a Zectronic energy beam, the Daleks will be able to conquer the entire universe within minutes. With just a beam? How? I'll explain later. Prepare to operate the Zectronic beam in five Dalek minutes! I obey. 
You may conquer the universe, but you'll have to share it with the beard and the bosoms over there. The master will be exterminated when he has served his purpose. If the master knew that the Daleks intend to kill him, he might help us. But how are you going to tell him without the Daleks hearing? They'll exterminate you on the spot if you say anything. I think we've really had it this time. Don't cancel our wedding yet, my darling. There's just one thing you've forgotten. What? Daleks don't have noses. Scraping the barrel a bit there, aren't you? Think, my dear. Back on Tursurus, the Master and I both bribed the castle architect. Not only do I speak perfect Tursurin, but so does he. You mean? Yes. I can communicate with the Master by carefully controlled breaking of wind. Could I be tied to a different chair? Side, Lance. Why do you have chairs on a Dalek spaceship anyway? We will explain later. Danger. You are facing certain doob. Certain doob? Try not to clench. The Daleks are planning to exterminate you as soon as you twiddly hippie jeep creep. Sorry, that was me. Cease this communication! You have betrayed the Daleks! Exterminate! 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 You fools! This iconic beam controller will now not only explode, it will implode! We're doomed! Repair the sectronic beam! It is beyond my ability. Only the doctor can do it. Help him! He's dying! Yes, my darling. He, uh... Oh. He says I love you. Oh, doctor. You've killed him! I think not, my child. This is only his ninth body. He has many, many more. Behold, the miracle of the Time Lord. Oh, sorry about that. I thought I'd just slip into something more comfortable. Result, cute, sexy, and lick the mirror handsome. I remember you, don't I? And you still fear me, Doctor? You're the camp one. I'm not camp. Oh, yeah. Nice tits. Bumps. Remember you lot, of course. And, uh, you're my fiance? You remember me, then? How could I possibly forget the only time-traveling companion I've ever had? You've had lots of companions. The only time-traveling companion I've had. Oh, right. It's still me in here, Emma. These old hearts are still yours. Can you still love me in my new body? Actually, I don't think I'll have too much of a problem with that. Uh, back to the TARDIS. The electronic beam controller is going to explode! Help us, Doctor, and your life will be spared! <laughs> what better way to end my career than saving you metal gits? Pop into the TARDIS, get a bottle of good champagne. When you come out, we'll start celebrating the beginning of our new life together. Great! I think in my new body I'm going to be particularly good at rewiring. Oh, bugger! Doctor? Ah! <laughs> You're my fiance, aren't you? Oh, dear. <laughs> Seem to be a bit shy of girls now. One of the problems of changing personas. <laughs> so unpredictable. <laughs> Doctor, look at me. In a minute. Oh, dear, another girl. <laughs> I'm not a girl, Doctor. I've told you before. These are Dalek bumps. They can locate etheric beam emissions and everything. So, uh, you don't want to try again, do you? I guess it's probably not a bad idea, actually. Shouldn't be too much of a problem. Actually, I think the problem's probably located in this area. Oh, 
of Jenna. Look at that. I've gone and used up three whole bodies in just under a minute, and all because I forgot to unplug first. That really was terribly silly of me. Sorry about that, my dear. A bit unfortunate. Oh, Doctor. Oh, assistant. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor! Residual energy. I'm a stupid ass should have realized. The doctor has saved the Daleks. His life will be spared. No. His life is already lost. That was a discharge of pure Zactronic energy. Even a Time Lord cannot survive its terrible power. But he can just change again, can't you, Doctor? I'm afraid not, my dear. Zactronic energy... too powerful. It has destroyed my ability to regenerate. I'm afraid this is the end. Look after the universe for me. I've put a lot of work into it. But how can we look after it without you? I'll explain. Doctor, listen to me. You can't die. You're too... You're too nice. Too brave, too kind, and far, far too silly. You're like Father Christmas, the Wizard of Oz, Scooby-Doo. And I love you very much. And we all need you, and you simply cannot die. He was the best and bravest of all my foes. From this day forward, I will renounce evil and follow the path of goodness to honor my fallen foe. The Doctor saved the Daleks. The Daleks, too, will honor their mortal enemy. He was never cruel and never cowardly. And it'll never be safe to be scared again. <gasps> it's impossible. Beyond all known laws of the universe. Maybe even the universe can't bear to be without the Doctor. Emma, look. I've got etheric beam locators. No, Doctor. I'm afraid those are actual breasts. Are you sure? I think I can see the on switch. No, Doctor, we have to face facts. You've come back to life, and this time, you're a woman. Really? I've always wanted to get my hands on one of these. Unfortunately, I haven't. Your mother's going to get a bit of a surprise at the wedding, isn't she? Do you think we'll both wear white? I'm afraid, Doctor. And I'm not sure this sentence has ever been used so completely accurately before, but you're just not the man I fell in love with. Well, never mind. We can still rattle around the universe, fighting monsters and saving planets. What could be more fun? My best friend by my side, my trusty old TARDIS, and, of course, my sonic screwdriver. Look, it's got three settings. Don't just stop that. Doctor, I have to say, you, you are rather gorgeous. I'm not bad, am I? Mm. And come to think of it, you're a great deal more attractive than I remember. Why, thank you. Tell me, why do they call you the master? I'll explain later. <laughs> <laughs> and breezy day and all manner of interplanetary species have got wind of a new televisual production security is tight if your name's not down you're not coming in sorry my templated friend your time will come in another dimension mark my words even though the riffraff had turned away you, the viewing public, are invited to a special behind-the-scenes glimpse of a new chapter of a TV legend. Welcome.
It's a hectic three-day shoot to bring the doctor back to life for comic relief. So, how did it all begin? One of the other producers, husband, is obsessed by Doctor Who. And so I think when she started to produce the show, he thought this was an ideal opportunity um, to actually write the Doctor for, for once. Having inseminated the producer, I obviously was obliged to work for Comic Relief at that stage. Um, and uh, since Sue, and it was Sue that I inseminated rather than Richard Curtis, uh, um, asked me, suggested that we do a uh, Doctor Who comic relief sketch because I like Doctor Who. And that was a minimum of research, really. Uh, it's a fantastic match with comic relief. What we always try and do is little tiny specials um, using as many famous people as we can. And this is such a good one because the format, Doctor Who itself, is, as it were, as famous, stroke more famous than the people we've actually got in it. So it's a perfect little comic relief thing. Where are we, Doctor? The planet Tercerus. Once home to the Tercerans. The most peace-loving and kindly race I've ever encountered. Um, the first person we asked was Rowan, because I knew he'd always wanted to play Doctor Who. So he said yes instantly. So he's the first one. Say hello to the sofa of reasonable comfort. Um, second one, Richard E. Grant, who does something for us every year. He's playing um, the quite handsome Doctor. Cute, sexy, and lick the mirror handsome. A vain, uh, sex maniac <laughs> type gospel. Jim Broadbent is playing the um, shy Doctor. Oh, bugger. I've been the bashful Doctor Who. The shy version, who doesn't um, <laughs> very little, he lit, has a life for about 15 seconds, I think. That's about his lot. One of the problems of changing personas, <laughs> so unpredictable. <laughs> and then Hugh Grant is playing um, the handsome doctor. Oh dear, now look at that. I've gone and used up three whole bodies in just under a minute, more because I forgot to unplug first. Obviously, a, a, a lifelong ambition finally fulfilled, so it was a very special day for me. Hugh is an actor of enormous variety and skill who basically feels he has to do what I tell him to when it comes to comic relief. He did a great thing with four years ago where the public paid a million quid for him to kiss Dawn French. A million pounds? Yes, I know. Close your eyes, lie back and think of England, for God's sake. <laughs> Emma, look. I've got hysteric beam locators. I was just now Hugh Grant and... Uh, Luckily, I've turned into me. And then the final Doctor is um, Joanna Lumley, who is um, really the most attractive of the Doctors, and once went to Eritrea for comic relief and has always done stuff for us, so no one escapes. Um, comic relief is like a Dalek. It um, exterminates people's free time. <laughs> With such a positive galaxy of top Hollywood talent on hand to play the Doctor, who on earth could portray his evil adversary? You know, if you're going to spy on me, you really should turn the speaker off. Well, Jonathan Brown is fantastic as the master. I mean, he's just so brilliant. I mean, the funny thing is, is, is you can't imagine anybody else playing it. You know, I mean, I know everybody has, I think, but he takes the mantle so wonderfully. I mean, we looked at some of the old tape at the start, you know, I just showed him a couple of pictures, but he just had no real idea. I'm sorry, I, I cannot be referred to as Jonathan. You must call me the master. Right? I think he's wonderful, but uh, sneaky sneaky and slightly devious and actually fumbling my bottom even as we speak which is something that Jonathan Price needs to do to get into character famed for it Madonna mentioned that he did that I think he, he wants to continue doing that in other roles far superior far superior than anything else I've ever done before be it James Bond be it Hamlet be it whose line is it anyway this is uh, this is the pinnacle of my career could be the end of my career as well I think that's more likely. I'm going to kill a doctor with my bare hands. In Welsh. Die, boyo. Die. I mean, he's an ace baddie anyway, if he wants to be. And, uh, and he just takes on that sort of manic, megalomaniac quality rather too well, actually, I would say. <laughs> it's 
it's impossible to leave this part behind me. As you can see now, this I, this is my tea break, for God's sake, and I cannot, I cannot get rid of this part. It possesses me entirely. Of course, the Doctor never travels anywhere without his beautiful assistant. Together, they're the Richard and Judy of intergalactic space travel. Doctor, will you stop showing off? You've got something to tell the Master. Just tell him. The Doctor really benefits only by having an audience with him. In other words, if he didn't have his beautiful young assistant, Emma, or whoever with him at that time, um, I don't think he would behave the way he did. So I think one of the great things about it is the fact that, that, that he and the Master, both Time Lords, actually only operate in front of someone adoringly looking up at them saying, how did you do that? I'll explain later. And I think that that is the key to their characters in all cases. They're basically show-offs. I can communicate with the master by carefully controlled breaking of wind. Could I be tied to a different chair? Side glance. Well, she never really got to do much, did she, the assistant? So it was always... When you are told to speak. The only one I remember is Louise Jameson, who was a very sexy, sort of um, intelligent doctor's assistant. And I spoke to her a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, I got a few hints off her. Not as far as the sexy part is concerned, but as far as, as far as the intelligent part is concerned. So what can you do with that, then? What? You don't know, do you? Yeah, it feels great, actually. I mean, I was a, a long time ago, I was asked to go for an audition for the real Doctor Who. I didn't really fancy it at the time. So this, you know, I'm getting my chance to do it now. Um, <laughs> sort of the spoof version of it, which is a lot more fun. And because it's for such a good cause as well. I anticipate it naturally. You're traveling back in time, and I travel back in time to an even further point in time I travel back. <laughs> I bribed the architect first. <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> There's not one person around here who hasn't got some memory of either sitting behind a sofa or hiding under their mother's coat or whatever when it had Doctor Who on. I used to watch them when I was uh, younger. I think um, they're fantastic. I think they're fun. I remember curling my little brother's hair once for a fancy dress party so that he could look like John Pertwee. And actually my son looks like John Pertwee without curlers. Uh, so no, I mean, I think it's a great British tradition and more fun than you can say. I was a great Doctor Who fan right from, the, from the word go. Uh, uh, William Hartnell, well done. I go right the way through. William Hartnell, I thought was brilliant. I had no idea, he just couldn't remember his lines. I thought it was sort of brilliant acting. Oh dear, now where were we? Ah, yes, gosh, yes, yes, yes. I think William Hartnell was absolutely my favorite Doctor Who that has been involved in this process today. Um, he looked remarkably like Joanna Lumley. I think it's extraordinary how he has transmogrified himself after all these years, come back to, to join us in this wonderful enterprise. You've come back to life and this time you're a woman. Really? I've always wanted to get my hands on one of these. Unfortunately, I haven't. Well, there has been proposed many times that the Doctor could uh, gender swap. Um, and uh, I think maybe they should have done it in the series when it was when it was ailing towards the end. I think um, pushing that panic button might have been quite fun. But then if you're going to cast a female Doctor, I think we've got the, the best one you could possibly have. You are rather gorgeous. I'm not bad, am I? I feel as though as long as it's all right by Stephen Moffat, it's all right by us, because he feels as though that was always a possibility. And I think they, I think it was mooted at some point that the Doctor might be a woman. He's not human. Um, he's got two hearts, so there's no reason he shouldn't take on a female body, I believe. I think they'll be cautious at first, um, tentative, and finally overwhelmingly supportive. I think they're going to adore it. Well, Joanna, only time will tell. Those Doctor Who fans are a tricky bunch. But never fear, our gallant crew have done their homework. I poured my way through the books that existed and I've watched something like 15 hours of tapes, um, some of it two or three times, and tried to sort of find the, the distill what I hope is, is everybody's idea of Doctor Who. Because obviously it has changed enormously. One forgets actually how much it has changed since the sort of William Hartnell days, right through Sylvester McCoy, right through to the movie sort of Paul McGann version. I am the Doctor! Pain, tears and torture, all part of the thespians' efforts to immerse themselves in the characters of Doctor Who. It's a psychological minefield, even for our trained professionals. I find the inspiration for the role of master to come from the cosmos itself. I draw my energy from the various zectronic energy beam controllers which 
are facilitated around the set. And tea, I find tea helps. I'm a virgin to this whole world, so um, I'm afraid my inspiration is completely uh, by osmosis from my interplanetary surroundings. No idea what I'm doing. Well, I'm one of those actors that likes to keep certain things secret. Um, it comes from very, very deep, my performances, uh, and especially today. And uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to keep that sort of to myself. I spent most of my childhood researching for this part, and then during my son's childhood, and then during today, watching all the other Doctor Who's. And uh, I feel, I'm feeling confident. I'm getting a, a grip of the role. I love it. I did extensive research for this role. Of course, there have been many masters in the past, and I looked long, long and intently at a photograph of one of them for seconds. <laughs> yeah, <I'll do. laughs> the master's laugh is, it's not really a laugh. It's a war cry. You see, subtle difference. Laugh, ha, ha, ha. Master is, I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to kill you. You see, you see the difference? <laughs> It's, uh, it's a marvellous process. It's come from years of watching Brian Blessed work. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to kill the Doctor with my own bare hands. Die, Doctor! Die! <laughs> I've been crushed. I think we've had a spike of doom. Do we fall through a trap door? Yes, I think we do. Prepare yourself for 500 miles of fear and fizzies. <laughs> <laughs> and fun. <laughs> Don't worry. I believe he knows the way out. It takes a man who regularly doubles for that splendid Scot, Sean Connery, to perform one of the most dangerous stunts ever committed to film. While I'm playing the master in Doctor Who, I'm doing the stunt, falling through the trapdoor. Nice fall. Stay down there. It's just standing on the trapdoor and making sure you don't hit the edges. Simple as that. Goodbye forever, Mr. and Mrs. Doctor. <laughs> That's basically it. End of day one, I would say it was a success. I'm still standing up, I'm still smiling. It's gone well, I mean, it's very difficult because we're actually working on four sets at the same time. Um, we have problems, we have bits of blue screen to stick in, we have effects, we have stone blocks that fall over, we have things that revolve, we have spikes of doom that aren't spiky. But uh, no, it's been very successful, very good day. Day one over, the stuntman is allowed to return to his stunt home and the production is bang on time, but there's no room to dilly-dally. Every new day starts with assembly in the main hall and a briefing on the very latest technology. So that extends, David, yes? Yes. Yeah. Whoa. My God. And this one just wobbles about? That it does, just wobble. I see. And this is the first for me to work with Daleks. I must say that it's been quite enjoyable so far, although I don't want to... Uh, they don't scare me. They do scare a lot of people. It's very interesting how everybody's walked up to them and sort of the hands gone out and not quite touched it because they're not quite certain. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> the only th ridiculous thing is when you hear things like the Daleks have been called to 8 o'clock. I think that sort of makes you laugh a little bit. Yep, yeah, we've had them all through here. Ryan Atkinson, Joanna Lumley. But the Daleks are the worst. They always want the Brussels sprouts. No, I mean, it's really one, two, three, four. Right. <laughs> Exterminate. Exterminate. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I thought up until I arrived here that I'd be quite fun to be a Dalek. But they're very, very small inside, and, and they bump into things, and you can't really exterminate. So it's really like being in a soul, sort of a... Sort of running around in a bit of 60s pop art and casters. I'm never going to be a Dalek again. It's rubbish. Exterminate me, Stephen. Come on. Um, <laughs> that's like man. <laughs> look, will, will you people let me focus? <laughs> I would like a look at my life and a moment of quietness to study and collect my performance. You people are just standing around sort of wittering away. Fortunately, I think the most fearsome um, Doctor Who monster for me is the Daleks. I was once allowed to go to, I think that Momi, they had a Doctor Who exhibition. You were allowed to step inside the Dalek and then talk, and it actually did do um, the funny voice. And um, 
I felt very proud and very scared at the same time. So I'm, I'm next to the King of Terror here. We are the masters of Earth. The Daleks still scare me. I still have nightmares about them. And uh, I feel that today's been useful in that respect as well, in exercising some of those fears. And uh, I think I can go forward in life now, uh, a more centred human being. Have you seen this? Look. Let's just pretend. It's wood, Julia, wood. You, of all people, should know about wood. <laughs> That's it. I'm never working for you again. Oh, double your salary. Always a Dalek. Always the most frightening things. The sight of the Daleks coming around the corner is just more terrifying than my agent not calling me. You know? I don't want to offend any Daleks, but they are... They are unique. 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 A toilet plunging uniqueness. Stop! I can't hear you. Yeah, you my darling. That's his eye! <laughs> you may think that's my eye. <laughs> Rounding up a battalion of Daleks is never an easy task, but say hello to the Davos of Shoreham by Sea. These Daleks were built maybe three or four years ago for our own amateur purposes. We were doing an amateur production of uh, oh, Doctor yeah. Who. I built the domes, then a bit more, then a bit more, and now there's like four of them. And since then, the demon actually peaked his door. <laughs> we weren't quite sure how to build the Daleks. Um, guesswork most of the time. Naturally, there's a sink plunger, bits of plastic, loads of wood, lungs full of sawdust, and loads of patience. At the moment, um, you've got controls inside, so you can move the head round and the eye, and all the, uh, the gun sticks and plungers move. Other than that, you just sit on the little seat and push it round with your feet. So it's uh, all manual. It gets a bit cramped uh, up top. Down below, it's not too bad. But uh, the main thing is people tend to forget you're inside them and uh, walk off and leave you. No, I'm sorry, but is the person in here still? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> sweetheart. <laughs> Little hot breath coming out of the railings, I can feel like a kind of caged hamster. You can go at quite a speed uh, if the floor's good and you're confident about where you're going, because vision is not excellent in these things. The worst uh, accident I've ever had is when I uh, fell off the side of a curb and tipped over sideways. And one of the big problems in these is that you can't put your foot down to stop yourself. Luckily, I didn't have to go to casualty and explain myself. As far as I know, none of my Daleks have ever been out of the house on their own, never been to parties. We don't take them to conventions. We only use them for our own film. Is this the way you treat all your guests? Until today, until the day we were called up by the BBC, stardom. These, these guys have now rank along with the others. All of them were destroyed. As day two ends, the Daleks are put to bed, the man shimmers a shimmery thing, and the crew bond in a quiet moment. <laughs> well, I the final day of the shoot and everyone's still looking splendid, thanks to that brave lass from the costume department. This is absolutely necessary. <laughs> Just wondering if I not wear the jacket when I wear the coat, so it's a bit tight. Right. Jab on the other side. <laughs> so sorry. I'll take it. This is the master's costume, and because he goes through four different costume changes altogether, i.e. when he first meets Doctor Who, then 312, 612 and 900. Wait for me! We had to make a black see-through cape on top, which we would then put alien poo on. <laughs> and then it would get vaguely dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And then in that corner there, you see there's a whole load of lettuce, and I nearly bought my baby's nappies in, but not quite. Oh, God, have we got a handkerchief? <laughs> and then you have something called cobweb spray, which is basically glue in an aerosol tin, but it makes a cobweb. Oh, I got it. The powers and wonder of filmmaking. Usually, in a normal production, you would have four costumes, so that you wouldn't have any of this problem of continuity and making sure the first one looked pristine. 
but we haven't got much money because all the money is going to go to better causes. She's a feisty filly, that one, no mistake. Meanwhile, the filming continues on sets so realistic you'd think you're in orbit. These are top-notch creations, mind, built from the finest space-age materials. Right, the TARDIS is essentially uh, made out of, of hardboard and, and wood to, to get the basic structure right. Uh, and on top of that, all the controls are made out of things like ping-pong balls and uh, Christmas tree lights. People are always asking how long it takes to make the TARDIS console. Um, I don't really know. I mean, it's just something we've worked on on occasions, weekends and stuff like that, like the rest of the things we do. Um, but I do know one thing. These ping-pong balls drove me absolutely mad. Sanding the damn things down. It's crazy. I think if you're going to try and make a copy of something, you want to get it reasonably right. I mean, we just sort of work from photographs, so I don't think there's an accurate measurement in it. But it just gives the impression of what it's, what it's meant to be. And they liked it here, so it's been fun. I think Comic Relief contacted us because there was, uh, I think, an article done on amateur um, films. And uh, they just liked the look of the set and the Daleks and, and all the walls and stuff. So we we're quite happy to provide. Of course, the difficult part's landed. <laughs> now she tells us why. Everybody is, uh, generally has a hobby, and it's nice to have a hobby with an actual physical result. Now! From our point of view, uh, it was built for a specific purpose, and we just got carried away a little bit. Um, but it's fine. I, I don't see that there's any harm in it. Close to the end of a gruelling shoot, and our actors prepare for one final emotional scene. What's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> I thought a Dalek said something, didn't they? No. no. Have, have, we cut, have we cut all my lines yeah, then? <laughs> very serious Doctor Who fans will be offended, um, I suppose, but, but then very serious Doctor Who fans are offended by a large amount of Doctor Who. Um, they don't like it when it's played for laughs, as Tom Baker did sometimes. Even a sonic screwdriver won't get me out of this one. They didn't like Paul McGann having a snog in the most recent movie. But I think the, the majority of Doctor Who fans don't take it that seriously because it's not a seriously intended program. There's a lot of fun in Doctor Who, a lot of comedy. Uh, you know, Douglas Adams wrote some Doctor Who stories and they were very funny indeed. So then the Dalek speaks, then you speak, then I speak. Um, I, no, I speak. I speak, Dalek speak, then you speak. If you know what Doctor Who was really like, as opposed to have gone completely mad and think it was a, a serious, gritty space drama, then I don't think you'll find anything to offend you in this. <laughs> well, you know, maybe the sonic screwdriver joke. <laughs> oh, look, it's got three settings. Doctor, stop that! I'm trying not to send it up. It isn't, it isn't, you don't want to send it up. It isn't necessary. It is funny because everybody playing in it is very funny. And what they do is very funny. But, you know, you don't send up the fact that the budgets were always so restricted and the sets were slightly wobbly and things like that. Well, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Performance is always soared and through in those early stages, and I scared a load of kids for all their years, including me when I was tiny. I'm hopefully getting the, the tone of it right, so we're making a comedy out of Doctor Who rather than a joke out of Doctor Who. Because Doctor Who was quite funny anyway, and it wasn't above poking fun at itself, and that's what we're doing in a mild, loving, affectionate way. And it will never be safe to be scared again. Who are we going to call now? Well, my agent, because you cut my life. Oh, bollocks! <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is a wrap. Well done. Thank you very much. So it's all over, but the big question remains, will the Doctor ever be back for good? I'd love to do Doctor Who for real, but uh, I, I don't know if I've got any serious plans to resurrect it, and I uh, hope we haven't written it off forever. We certainly used up the rest of the Doctor's incarnation, so we might, but hopefully not. No, I'd definitely be up for it. That would be incredibly exciting. I'd say, yes, please! I'd adore that. No, I think, I think the, do the Doctor seems to be getting younger and handsomer, and I'm going the other way. So it's, uh... I think I've missed out on that one. <laughs> I gotta tell you, that's not a decent career. No wonder the Daleks are so pissed off with everybody. Never work with Daleks and children, that's for sure. Right. Okay, oh look, he's only three foot tall. Off he goes.
Hey, thanks for coming. We've got a fantastic show still to come. In a few minutes, Doctor Who meets old friends. We meet again! Yes. How are things? At 8.15, the boys are back in town. I am not doing anything for comic blooming relief. And talking of boys, at 8.30, Boys Home will be performing the comic relief single live in the studio. On BBC Two at 9, get chatty with Alan Partridge. So give me a call, please! Seriously, though, do give me a call. At 9.45, back on one, Victoria Wood goes undercover. But I do look like a person who's auditioning to be a nightclub singer. Oh, don't get your villas in a heap of Agnes. Clodo Rogers would kill for that coat. Now, go on. And at 10.20, the far show live. Sir. Oh, did you want it, sir? Did she, sir? Did she? Did you want it, sir? Oh, suit you, sir. Suit you, sir. Oh. It's all here on Comic Relief. But now, Zoe, it's what we've been waiting for. Okay. It's what we've been rehearsing. You ready? Shall I do the bass line? Yeah, you do the OK, you ready? <laughs> 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 Part's even better. That's great. So right. And you can see part two of Doctor Who before the news, part three just after it, and with some astonishing celebrities, part four just after that. Okay, now I have a joke now, I'm afraid. <clears throat> knock, knock. Oh, who's there? Yes, it's Doctor Who part two. Do you see? <laughs> um, you waited long enough, and here it is. It's as it's terrifying as Fern Britain, and believe me, that's an achievement. I don't know, if I've, seen I know I've seen that close. Um, a comic relief special made especially for you to encourage you to call. The numbers on the screen, dial it as you scream. <laughs> calling because we want to have the most calls in our hour. Yes. Then we now, listen here. Right? Here's the joke. Knock. Knock. <laughs> Who's there? <laughs> yes. That's right. Oh, Doctor Who. I knew it. I oh, knew it. Do you see? Do you see? <laughs> That is coming up in about 15 minutes. There we go. Oh, oh, no, you're perfectly normal, actually. <laughs> Another joke. Knock, knock. Oh, well, I'm expecting Doctor Who. Who's there? It's Doctor Who. I mean, yes, I see. <laughs> uh, and this time it's starring huge special celebrity people. Here for you for comic relief on the condition that you ring oh. 0345 460 460 is the fabulous Doctor Who, the final instalment. Oh. <laughs> use a phone box, but you can do it from home. 0345 460 460.